Hey friends, this is Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous, where we analyze pop culture through the lens of race or gender, and sometimes both. And this week on the show, you are getting a rebroadcast of when Natalie Katona and I covered one of my all-time top five favorite movies in history ever, A League of Their Own, starring Gina Davis and Tom Hanks and Madonna and Rosie O'Donnell and a ton of other people. This is an edited version of that live show where we discuss the films. At the time, we had just finished the prime original series of the same name, so we naturally compared the two. If you want the full unedited version, you can head to YouTube. The link will be in our show notes. You can give that a listen. Otherwise, just listen to this edited down version. And now, here we go to the show. All right, we are live. Players, let's play ball. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is Still Comfy with Nat and Jules. Um, I'm your host of the evening. I'm Natalie Katona from To All the Men I've Tolerated Before. And we will be covering A League of Their Own because over on Jules's Instagram, where pop culture makes me jealous, we did the show, the Amazon Prime show. Jules, introduce yourself. <laughs> Hello, friends. I'm Julia Washington, your host of Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous, where we analyze pop culture through the lens of race or gender and sometimes both. I just realized that I didn't write down any facts about a league of their own. So let like me what, pull it. What kind of facts? Like, the don't we usually do the, like, year the that summary? it came out and the summer? 1992. Right. Yep, here it right. is. A League of Their Own is a movie that came out in 1992. It is two hours and eight minutes long. And if you remember anything, that means it doesn't meet Nadley's rule of movies shouldn't be longer than 90 minutes. Um, against all odds, Madonna gets to be on the poster, even though she doesn't have that many lines. <laughs> she was a big draw, though. She was a big draw. Um, two sisters join the first female professional baseball league and struggle to help it succeed amid their own rivalry. Madonna is doing the most in this movie in all of the right ways. Well, I think that was the intention of her character. All the I'm way aware. Made. I'm just saying that I missed it in the television show because in the television show, there was no Madonna-esque uh, character to do it all and do it all in all the ways and go all the way all the way may yeah yeah i did love i do love this movie so much it's not it's a, healthy it's a great movie and do you know what i realized this first go around or this go around of watching it so Tell i me. thought so i thought that after like kit pushes dotty and dotty loses for the peaches or whatever that Kit and Dottie have no contact oh. until they, like, look at each other at the, like, old ladies museum. 50 years the, later. Yeah, 50 years later at the Baseball Hall of Fame. And then I realized, I was like, no. They have a Her moment. daughter clearly says Auntie Kit. They've clearly fucking carried on a relationship for the entire lives. Like, I thought their rivalry went so deep that they were like, and now we'll never speak again. No, not at all. No. I love that moment after the fact because I think it's so crucial to the story um, because Kit finally gets her moment. Dottie's, you know, acknowledging like you, you're not, she's not, it's not like she's saying she's the better player, but she's acknowledging like, good for you, Kit. Like, I'm proud of you. And they have this like really sweet sisterly moment. <clears throat> Excuse as, me. as you know, everything about Dottie throwing the game pisses me off. <laughs> Because I am a firm believer that if you are talented, you are allowed to be talented, no matter how much it makes other people feel. And that's a huge theme in this movie where, you know, Gina Davis is naturally gorgeous Gina Davis. And I also believe that people have the right to be pretty. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just going to, I'm pro pretty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, people have the right to be pretty. Yeah. And then like. And then she's good at baseball, and people deserve to. And it turns out the actress Gina Davis is also naturally good at baseball because when they is were she? doing, yeah, because when they were doing like the whole training and getting ready for it, because you know they actually played baseball in this movie. Um, one of the trainers told her like, "You're naturally athletic." Oh my gosh, Gina! 
Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Also, thank God there was no CGI in this movie. I hate CGI. Well, and I think when it comes to like certain types of CGI, it's it doesn't bother me. But when it comes to a sports movie, yeah. like especially if you watch that sport on the regular, you can tell when it's not what's not when it's not happening. Like they're like the way the baseballs were thrown in the prime series you know that was my number one complaint because it's yeah. like that's not how it looks when you play baseball this is not, not a realistic visual <laughs> and i think it's like cgi is the worst when there's like no reason for it and you know that things aren't supposed to be over the top and like perfectly fast in a straight line and you're mm -hmm. like why is this the choice that we made yeah nobody we, throws like that <laughs> we could have taught them how to throw balls mm -hmm. or we could have dubbed them. Like, why wouldn't you have just paid a stunt person to do that? Yeah. Irritating. Yeah. But you know, I believe that Gina Davis has the right to be pretty and talented. Mm -hmm. And so Kit gets on my, I mean, my second note after I wrote like, oh, I guess they did talk was, oh my God, I don't know if even modern age grown namely is going to be uh, able to get over kit she just has the shittiest face the entire movie well, i mean i understand where kit's coming from like when you have your parents basically saying to you your entire life why aren't you like dotty be quiet you're annoying you're obnoxious you're taking up space and you shouldn't be that's gonna affect your psyche that's gonna put you in a position where you're not really like where you instead of like understanding what it is or realizing that it's your parents, not you, you're going to start placing that blame on the person who is glorified all the time. Right. Like, right. Th like when she says to Dottie, like, you're always ruining, you're getting in my way. Like I knew I was getting too good. And this is all like, you are the reason this isn't working. Cause you think I'm getting too good. Like in that moment, I was like, Oh, you don't understand because you've never been allowed to experience a full range of emotions you don't understand that it has nothing to do with Dottie mm -mm. and you've and the external elements you've never been allowed to be away from the elements that say Dottie's the best so you can grow into who you want who you are in the strengths right. that you have I mean I don't know kids just like she's shitty and she's shitty for a reason but it still makes my skin crawl <laughs> because I'm like stop it kit my first point of misogyny, can we talk about how, like, Marla wasn't, like, I Marla it, Hooch. <laughs> Marla Hooch. Justice for Marla Hooch. She was not in any way scary ugly. No. She wasn't. She was like, not. The, the way that people reacted. <laughs> yeah. To Marla's face. And I'm John like. I love it. <laughs> I, you know, we gotta go Ooh. we gotta go you ain't taking her because she ain't pretty and they i did sit love down. i was like that is a solid move ladies they yeah. set down their bags and they're just like nope fuck no nope. we're not going without a, a great word player we're not leaving without her without a word they didn't just looked at him <laughs> and he knew but like and it wasn't even the one joke. They make that joke four or five times. Like, they don't let her show on camera. She's, like, all yeah, the way. Yeah, far back. Yeah. yeah. Just okay. waving. And then there's Marla. <laughs> Do we even know if it's really her? It's so far away. It's so far away. I feel bad for Marla. Well, and her her dad, do, you know, I know my daughter isn't in as pretty as these girls, but her mama died when she was whatever, and I raised her like a boy, and da da da, da. And I and, ruined her. Yeah, and I was just like, oh, honey, like, he, it's okay that you don't know how to be femme for your daughter. Like, that's not who you are. It's fine. Broke my heart. Yeah. Broke my heart. Yeah. Like, I was like, oh, sir. No, you probably loved her the best. And out of any of these daddies, you probably did the best job. So and and proof positive in the scene when they're at the train station leaving and she's I mean, I like that's a moment where I cry because yeah. she's like, who's going to take care of you? I don't need to go. Da, da, da. And he's like, we've literally been working for this. Like, you have to. It's going to be fine. And yeah. I just loved that moment. It was so beautiful. It was so cute. 
the cutest. He's <laughs> like, he did the thing. He's yeah. being so great. Mm -hmm. So justice for Marla, who, by the way, is technically the only one that we know gets laid after yeah. she does her little karaoke. Well, I mean, we know that Madonna gets laid. Well, yeah. But Marla's the one who finds love. And I love that twist. It's not a twist, but I love that turn for her because it of all the women and everyone's like, oh, they're so beautiful and they're dollies and like dirt in the skirt and show your whatever. Marla's the one that finds love. That makes me so happy. She's so sweet. Um, I thought between the charm classes that in the movie, it was more of a, this will be a little blip and it'll highlight that we made them take charm classes and that Marla cannot walk. <laughs> and then I think the show tried to make more of a statement about it. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the show and the movie, that's the only time that the show made more of a statement than the movie. Because the entire time I'm like, this is where the show was supposed to make a statement and they just skipped it. Mm -hmm. This is where the show is supposed to make a statement, and they just skipped it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mean in the movie? This is where yeah, with in the, the in the movie. The, I have a yeah. couple written down. Let me look. Because when she's like, "Nice, very nice, lovely," and she mm -hmm. <gasps> she gets to Marla, <gasps> and <gasps> then the assistant's like, "What do you recommend?" And she's like, a lot of night games. Yeah. <laughs> so like, terrible, funny line, but also shitty. Also shitty. The Shirley Baker scene where she can't read her own lot name on the list. Mm -hmm. And that gorgeous Helen woman comes over. And That's just, the sister from Mad About You. I know. She's gorgeous in mm -hmm. this movie. Mm -hmm. I love her. I have her name written down. Everyone was so hot in this movie except for Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's supposed to be playing a washed up drunk. Like, As you know, I love, I love the Tom Hanks character. Yeah, I desperately Jamie missed Dugan. him in the show. Yeah. Um, but this movie has so much heart in it mm -hmm. that they tried to make really dramatic in the show and it just fell. And I was like, you took the heart out of my movie. Yeah. And you're not wrong because the first time I get emotional is within the first 20, you know, is at that Marla Hooch scene, which is mm -hmm. what, 15 minutes into the movie. Yeah. And then you have these very emotional moments throughout the rest of the film that when I was 12 didn't necessarily like resonate the same because you're still hopeful life, you know, hasn't ruined you yet. <laughs> you don't know the realities of misogyny quite fully, but every time now I can't not cry or get emotional watching it because it's so beautiful with all the ways that they st stand together, step up for each other. The way that yes. like Jimmy Dugan even comes around towards the yes. end of the film. He's just like, he's 100. And you know, he frames it with the whole, like, let's do this. I get a bonus when we get in the world series, but he's also actually emotionally yeah. invested. Like the money isn't the motivator. It's just a nice little perk. There's um, so much love between the women mm -hmm. in this movie that they forgot to do in the show even though they wanted them to all be in love with one another and i'm like right mm. right there's like no girl win moments in the show yeah. there's no like i see you struggling yeah i myself am a woman as well and i'm going to step in to stop your struggling. I wonder too if that's because in the 90s we were doing, there was a lot of that in the 90s mm -hmm. with female media and television. Yeah. You know, there's just a whole lot of like, and same, you know, even in the, I don't know, there was a little bit more of a hoorah kind of situation. Right. I feel like when I look back and reflect on earlier, late 80s, early 90s, television where we do sort of see more of a bond we're going to stick together because that's the strength in numbers this is the only mm -hmm. way we're going to survive whereas now even though we talk about well we need to band together it still feels very much like every man for himself yeah and i don't know for for everything that abby jacobson kept screaming at us that she was trying to deliver with the show i'm like it's like you didn't even watch the movie gina davis taught you how to do this and you just went mm. Mm. <laughs> they don't even help lupita learn english 
and they don't let her go to the wizard of oz i'm yeah. still mad yeah I'm yeah so i did think it was kind of a nice i didn't i forgot that um tom hanks when the bus breaks down and she's like mr dugan mr dugan and he- Mr. Dugan! And he's like, what is it, baby? And then they pull away and they scream and they're like, oh my god, what's happening? And he's like, oh, by the way, I loved you in The Wizard of Oz. (laughs) And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot he said that. So I do appreciate that they went and saw The Wizard of Oz in the series because I felt like that was a cute, like a a not Instead of assaulting someone in the name of The Wizard of Oz. Yeah, which she kind of does look like the lady from Wizard she of Oz. She looks exactly like that actress. She looks exactly like that actress. And honestly, so it's she... almost like yeah, that's an insult, but not really. Not really. Um, the movie also pissed me off about the show about something else. So when uh, Nick Offerman steps down, mm-hmm. and they just allow Abby Jacobson to coach i was like there's no way yeah like watching this movie i realized i was like there is no way that these men who just want to sell candy bars Mm -hmm. are not going to just bring in another man to tell you all what to do right like right i also think that that character needed to be there yeah because he also helps because that's their immediate first bond right they come Mm -hmm. in they're excited jimmy dugan this famous baseball player is going to be their coach but turns out he's not as exciting as they thought he would be so that's the first thing they initially bond over is like okay so our coach is trash so then that gives gina davis the opportunity to take the lead and be like here's what we're doing um and so they kind you know they create that connection right away before the first game and they don't do that in the series it takes several episodes for the team to finally find their footing which in baseball isn't always true because you have spring training not that these girls have spring training they were just kind of thrown into it but you do have opportunities to like develop a relationship with your teammates and we don't get any of that like they should have bonded well i don't want to say should have i don't want to shit all over somebody else's work i i think it was a missed opportunity to allow for the team to bond over offerman you know nick offerman's character not being involved right and instead he acted kind of like a foil to tear them all apart yeah because he like completely wiped out Carson's credibility because she still tried to work with him. Mm-hmm. Which I understand the urge to like still try to work with your authority figure because you're like, I mean, he's the one we've got. Yeah. And he could make or break your career, essentially. Right. You don't know. Yeah. And then I, I don't know. It's just that when I watched the movie, it just really highlighted how there's so much more characterization in this two hour movie to where I truly feel for these people. Mm -hmm. And I watched eight episodes of a show and I came out wanting a, what's her, what's the uncle's name in the, in the, a league of their own. You posted about him today. Oh, um, oh my gosh. Birdie. 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 I wanted an and the only thing I went was why aren't I getting an Uncle Bert spinoff? Yeah, because that actor yeah. knows how to put heart into their role. Yeah, the actor who played Bert did a really good job. Again, again, the series is a black show. Like yeah. those white girls, I don't know what the fuck those white girls were doing, but the mm-hmm. black girls knew what was up. They yeah. showed up. They did their role. They told the story. It was good. <clears throat> um. And back to your movie comment about how, you know, in those two hours you had, you felt they did a really good job in A League of Their Own. I think Penny, I know Penny Marshall directed it. I right. can't remember yeah. she wrote it too. <clears throat> Excuse me. They did a really good job at establishing very quickly who everybody was and what the relationships were. Mm-hmm. And I think that's so important to do not just in a film but also in a television show that you don't know if you're going to get a second series right excuse me 
because then it helps move the story along so much quicker like we immediately know in the original film Dottie and Kit have tension because Dottie's telling Kit what to do don't use that bat it's too heavy for you remember this one throws high ones you know you don't swing at the high ones you know I I love the high ones mule hack like you immediately Mm -hmm. get a sense of the relationship and that there's going to be tension between them within those first few minutes that does not exist in the show it's kind of like okay so what's happening which whatever again i don't want to shit all over somebody else's work with the film though the next time you get something that actually like you under fully understand what's happening with these characters is doris and may doris look what i can do may look 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 whatever and then she's like how long did it take you to do that and you know except for that time i spent the whatever so you establish their relationship very quickly just by sort of observing something and you get it like you've got historical context for the relationship because they've talked about they've mentioned you know something else and yeah all those little moments that really bring the team and give you what you need to know to fully understand so that way then you can dive quickly into what's going on and what the tension will be we know the team's gonna gunning for the world series but how are they gonna get there what's gonna happen and do you know what i think happened with the backdrop of the war (laughs) with the backdrop of the war do you know what i think happened with the prime show i think that they they didn't walk the line of mimicking the show and adding to the show well. So they mimicked that scene between Rosie O'Donnell and Madonna. Mm-hmm. And they kind of had a little quick, quick back and forth, back and forth. But then they completely dropped that relationship after that moment until yeah, they were in and, a fight. And that introduction was a little too long because mm-hmm. with the Rosie, with May and Doris, it's very quick. It's it's a very quick introduction, but you still get a lot in there. Yes. With the suitcase scene, it is a very long scene that feels drawn out and and could have been, you know, cut down a little bit and 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 tightened up a little bit to get to get the same impact and to piggyback on what you're saying continue that throughout because that's the beauty of the film they continue those types of snippets with doris and may throughout the entire movie like when there's the threat of shutting down the league may's like you tell that mr candy guy he can he's not shutting me down but you have that moment where it's like you see in doris her feel for May because that's how they met because she was doing dancing at Doris's dad's club and it's like again a quick snippet of like here's how we know each other and then it gets a callback when the when the league's threatening to shut him down Mm -hmm. and it gets called back again when Doris's dad comes to the playoffs and he's like May it's great to see you doing this instead of what you're usually doing and she's like daddy stop (laughs) yeah exactly so don't talk to May like that like so like, what? I'm here to buy you guys a steak dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but another place where I think they really dropped it and they tried to make a statement with the absence of what happened in the movie mm-hmm. was with Evelyn. So Evelyn has to have that little boy still stand still well. well angel. Still well angel. And he's the worst. You're he's a demon child from hell. <laughs> but so Evelyn gets this letter from her husband and he's like... You- our kid is the worst. He's annoying, and I'm not raising him just because you want to play baseball. And well, she's just... too busy reading the want ads. Yeah, he's too busy reading the want ads. So she just tells a drunk Tom Hanks, like, this is how it is. I have to have my kid on the road with us. My husband is ill-equipped to raise him. And then in the Prime show, they have an Evelyn Foyle. Who, instead of, like, making the statement of, which is still very prevalent and true today, that, oh my goodness, when children are inconvenient just by existing, the woman has to take that on. Mm -hmm. Instead of making that statement again in the show, they handled the Stillwell thing by making him an absent child that the new Evelyn has fled from. Yeah. And I know that the statement is is supposed to be this backwards, like, well, she shouldn't have had to bring her children. And it's like, yeah, but the movie made that statement by making you watch her raise a child on the baseball road. Right. 
and right. telling Jimmy Dugan, like, I, my husband's too busy being drunk like you and trying to get a job. So still Will has to come with me. <laughs> and the other layer of that is he's a man. We mm-hmm. can assume maybe he's not able-bodied because he's not working because he's reading the WAN ads. Right. So it is a time of war. We assume your husband is white. And he's unemployed during a time when they are recruiting literally everybody because every able-bodied white male is being sent overseas. Correct. So, like, even that's a huge statement. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he doesn't show up with grown-ups still well um, to the museum and they don't mention him. Right. So... I think that's what the show kept doing. It's like, well, we'll write the wrongs of the movie because we've evolved. And we're like, we haven't evolved, though. There are still hundreds of thousands of women who give up working to pick up the slack with their kids. Yeah, and I actually don't feel like there were wrongs with the film because the center of the story is Dottie and Kit. Right. So the sisters are the the crux of the story. And then the backdrop of that is, okay, now they're on a baseball team and Dottie's naturally gifted and Kit's really good too because she's had to keep up with Dottie. And then you add the layer of the war. So Mm -hmm. like that scene where the ball gets away and there's some black women on the side and I've talked about this on the episode we did on Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous of, of A League of Their Own. And she picks up the ball and Gina Davis is like right here. And like she chucks it and it gets to um, what's her face, the beauty queen, to show like she's Ellen just May. as ta- Yeah, she's just as talented. Like that nuance of these women were left out. And they, but that doesn't mean they weren't talented. Like to right. me, that was very clear. They were left out because they were black. Like that was a message I understood from the from childhood. Job. And so to see in, and it still makes me cry. It still makes me get emotional because mm-hmm. it's still saying we understand that th- this is a group of people who were left out of the All American Girls Professional Baseball League. Yes. And what I think the series did do okay again, black story because the because the Max Still convinced and, that they had two writing teams. Yeah, because Max and Clance is so fleshed out because then you get the backstory of like you know why black women were and you we should you it should be understood anyway. I feel like, but again, it's like this movie isn't about the peaches. The movie is about Kit and Dottie. Yeah, whereas. The prime original is not sure who it's about. <gasps> no. At any moment. Do you know? Okay. So when it comes to Tom K- Hanks. Oh, I fucking love Jimmy Dugan. Jimmy Dugan has all of the best lines. Like yeah, any. Because so funny. as I was watching the movie, all I could hear was my dad saying the lines that we love best from Jimmy Dugan. Yeah. Like you would just be out and about and dad would say a Jimmy Dugan line. <laughs> my favorite was avoid the clap, Jimmy yes. Dugan. <laughs> when he signs <laughs> That's not <laughs> I re- like I wrote down I was like avoid the ch- the clap because we know Jimmy probably did it. Like that's yeah. the advice he has. <laughs> yeah. And so Jimmy is disgusting in this movie. I mean, he redeems himself kind of at the end, but at the baseline, he has a lot of growth, but he's still a very disgusting drunk of a human. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Even at the end, when he redeems himself and he decides that he's like on board with Gina Davis wanting to be married or play baseball or whatever, disgusting (laughs) at his core. So then I was like, well, now I'm mad that the Prime show was so sparkly. They, like, took out the grit on the Peaches side. Yeah. Like, they made Nick Offerman mean, but he was, like, mean once. I was like, Jimmy Dugan was disgusting. (laughs) And Nick Offerman, bless his heart, but he's, hey, right? Like, he's good. (laughs) Right? Like, the way that he, like, delivers, like, he's got a very distinct face yes when and so it's like 
and it's expressive so when he's delivering lines it's just kind of like like he you know what i mean it's like it's yeah. just it's interesting seeing him in things and i don't think it's because i am obsessed with him as ron swanson i don't think it's that i think because he's also in a couple episodes of gilmore girls mm-hmm. and he he doesn't do it in gilmore girls but since parks and rec i'm seeing him consistently be like here's this face i'm making <laughs> i don't know if i describe that well does he do it in making it my favorite I only watched one episode show. of Making It, so I don't remember. Can we talk about how the only reason why we got a women's league is because men were like, there's a war. How will we sell candy? <laughs> yeah, actually, and that's pretty true to life. It was Wrigley, the guy who started Wrigley Gum. It yeah. was He's the one who kind of spearheaded the All-American Girls Baseball Professional, All-American Girls Professional baseball league so it wasn't because like oh no america needs a hobby we're so down in the dumps it's like i have to sell gum i have mm-hmm. numbers that i need to sell gum well i mean he's Wrigley field is named after him because Correct. he gave a ton of money and was like build it <laughs> build it it's mine make it happen and if you've noticed they're one of the few stadiums left that isn't named after some weird shit i'm looking yeah. at you pnc park <laughs> is that one by me yeah it's in cleveland yeah mm-hmm. that's where the guardians play i don't remember what we renamed one of the um uh, oh yes i do we have like the virgin mobile one because yeah is that what john cusack and joan cusack used to advertise for <laughs> did so they like, do phone commercials i don't recall that yeah they did also oh, interesting how cute like, is ann cusack as shirley baker I know. Just beautiful and cute as a butt. And yeah. everyone in this movie is so hot, except for Tom Hanks. <laughs> I don't know. He's got some kind of appeal to him for being like, as he cleans up through the movie. He doesn't actually fully clean up during the movie. No, but he does have a vibe that you're just like, okay, like you're you're better-ish. And then once he starts to get better adjacent fine ass bill pullman comes to town and you're like oh my god bill pullman you you know i want while you were sleeping to happen to me (sighs) like so bad yeah (sighs) his kid was in top gun maverick i was like why does this guy look like he's a bill pullman light and it's the one with the glasses and i was like this is gonna make me i gotta look right thank you imdb so I looked it up and I was like, oh, my God, you're Bill Pullman's son. I see it. Um, I feel really uncomfortable now because I also think you're cute. And now this is a weird phase of life to be in. This is a weird, it's a weird conjecture. When fucking, when fucking good looking Bill Pullman. And that's where they really missed the mark with the TV show. They didn't find anyone as fine as Bill Pullman to be the husband. <laughs> I love when he walks in and he's oh, like, hi, he's Judy. Judy. And he's oh. just in the door holding a hat. And she just, and we were on the heels of Betty Spaghetti's husband being dead. dead. He and died. the emotion that you see in Gina Davis's face, the concern, the that worry. Scene You're is holding so good. with her. You are very concerned. Tom is walking slowly to both of them. They're sitting next to each other. Which one is it? Oh my God, I can't take it anymore. Betty, I'm so sorry. It's George. She just can't. She can't. She and can't then, play. And then we go through, get them home, and Gina Davis is bawling because she's held all of these emotions about her husband being in the war. She can't take it anymore. That was her breaking point. And who walks in? The fine ass Bill Holman, looking the best he's ever looked. And she's like, I look terrible. And he's like, You are the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Bill Bowman is probably the reason why I wanted to be an army wife. That and that trashy show on Lifetime. <laughs> I was like, look at him with that hat and the khaki. So fucking sexy. <clears throat> and then like Tom Hanks sees Bill, Bill Bowman. And like, I think when I was a kid, because everything was supposed to be like romance centered, if it was mm-hmm. about women, I was mm-hmm. like, well, clearly Gina Davis and Tom Hanks had a really inappropriate crush on one another. That's what happens in all of the movies. And this go around, I was like, no, you were just conditioned to believe that they should have had a crush on one another. They just mutually understood one another. Yep. 
Yep. Totally, because they could have been a dynamite team had Dottie stayed in the league. Correct. Because she's a solid player. I mean, he's told her multiple times you're the best damn player in the league. Um, and he knows the sport inside out. And so, like, the way that she makes him better, it's not as a romantic partner. It's as a friend who cares. Because Gina Davis makes – because Dottie Henson made everybody better. better. Yeah. When she she doesn't want to go out drinking with them because she's a nice married lady, but she immediately gets word that they're about to get caught. So she drags them all out of the bar, including a singing in love Marla. And doesn't say they'll kick you out of the league. She says they'll kick us, us out, out of, the, of league. the league. Yeah. So she doesn't see herself as an individual unit. She sees herself as part of a team. Which is something else that was missing from the Prime show. I don't think that anyone on the Peaches side of the world in that show thought of anyone as an us. It wasn't the team. It wasn't all of us. It was this is my shot. This is my secret. This is what will get me kicked out of the league. Until Joe gets traded. And then yeah. they're like, oh, we need her. We're a team. I was like, have you been a team episode. this entire time? Because yeah. I missed it. I missed it. I missed it. I missed when you all liked one another. Um, God, Gina Davis is so good in this movie. She, oh, yeah. Yeah. She's fantastic. Yeah. Do you remember when she had her own show? The Gina Davis I show? I do. Yeah, I used to watch it. She'd always have like high-waisted pants on. Yeah. <laughs> I love Gina Davis. Um, And, God, the movie is so good. And even when Bill Pullman comes back to town like tom hanks does a double take probably because Do tom hanks is also like that is the finest man <laughs> i've ever seen yeah i have traveled the world with other men in baseball uniforms yeah. and you sir you are what a man should be mm -hmm. and honestly i would probably quit baseball if it meant going home with you <laughs> yep and he just knows he knows there's like and I also like that where he walks up to her because she's clearly packing up to go. And he's like, so this is it. Mm -hmm. And she's like, yeah, we're going to go home. We're going to have babies. And he's like, okay. And like, he, he knows he's in a position where he can push very hard to make her stay. Mm -hmm. But he also knows he's in no pos position to do that. So he says his like check in and then he goes back into the bus. Yeah. Doesn't he come back and give her a speech? Oh, maybe he does. Yeah, he's know. like, you're going to regret it and da, 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 and all these things. Like, you can go back to Oregon and do that. And you have all the time in the world to do that. But this right here, right Bro now, da, da, da. And here's the thing about the going home to have babies. Clearly, Kit had a buttload of babies. <laughs> like, she shows up to that museum with a buttload of a family. Gina Davis went by herself. There were one baby. <laughs> like, packed her a suitcase. And I was like, Gina... You could have had it all. You could have done the baseball. You could have continued to fuck Bill Pullman. And you could have had a lot of babies. <laughs> you know, did you ever see... Oh, shit. What was it called? Keep talking. I'm going to find it. Because it was the one thing I saw Bill Pullman in that made me the most uncomfortable. And I was really upset. Oh, no. Because Bill my Pullman. friend was like... Yeah to watch this show with me blah 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 no. it's like fine i will you know because i'm familiar with the this franchise you're talking about i understand what's happening blah blah i mean bill holman always be a nice man and then i watched this show with my friend no bill and Holman. i was like one this shit could really happen so i'm really upset that you made me watch it two i do not like no one wants to watch Bill home and be a bad, bad man. Um, did you know on the IMDb they list their baseball positions? I thought that that yeah. was really cool. Yeah, they do that <laughs> in the end credits too. That's awesome. Like, I was like, what a nod to people who understand baseball. <laughs> yeah, it's Torchwood. Oh, I didn't. I didn't realize Torchwood. it was from 2011. No, but it's like. I don't remember there being 41 episodes. Well, maybe you didn't watch all of it because it made Bill Pullman a bad man. No, because there's like a mini. Oh, you know what it is? I know why. I know why. 2011. 
Miracle Day. That's why. Tortured Miracle Day Series 4 um, is like a se- it's a separate series. It's the same series, Torchwood, but then it's like two years later, Miracle mm. two, And so it's a whole thing. So I only watched M- Torchwood Miracle Day. Um, and he is not a good person in it. And it was like, I turned to my Ew. friend. I turned to my friend and was like, I can't believe you fucking ruined Bill Pullman for me. I can't. Who wants to ruin Bill fucking Pullman? I was so mad. I was so, so mad. freaking mad. But then he redeemed himself by being in what was he in that I loved recently? Oh. I want to talk about uh, Death Del- Oh yeah. I want to talk about um Death Delivery Guy. Oh and how uh-huh. rude and awful he is. <laughs> I and have to have a name. There's no name on this list. Well, this is one, the federal government. Number one, he's just like narrating the fact that someone's gonna die. He's like, oh god, you know, the government couldn't even send you somebody. In Today's person. not a they good day for me. Yeah. Today's not a good day for me. I got to tell you that your husband's dead. And I was like, I want Tom Hanks to kill this man. But then again, I was like, this is something else that the show kind of tried to address and then glossed over was the realities of fucking war yeah because how many women did have just a bumbling idiot be like "Uh, it's a death telegram yeah again i think they did an okay job with it on max and clance's side yeah when clance's husband gets recruited and she's like this is scary because you know black um soldiers aren't treated the same and like all those things but i the other thing that i think was really (laughs) that i picked up on this time that i haven't picked up in years past because i think we forget they rebranded it's not the war department anymore but at the time they were you know the department of war Mm -hmm. now it's the department of defense oh and i can't remember when that switch happened over but they did a like a whole rebranding. One of my other favorite Make it lines. Less scary. One of my other favorite lines is when everyone has a turn telling Evelyn to keep that kid away from them, except for Gina Davis, who tells her, "I hope I have five just like yeah. you." <laughs> <laughs> the consummate professional. The consummate. Yeah, I hope I have woman. five. It's the fu- <laughs> It's one of the funniest lines when she goes i hope i have five just like him yeah because this movie's brilliant the, the movie deliveries of the co- you know the comedic timing the, the dialogue like all of it um tom hanks when rosie o'donnell had her own show tom hanks was on and he's they were talking about you know filming together blah blah and he's like yeah you know my they're talking about their favorite scenes he's like well my favorite scene is the you know i'm gonna show you so they show a clip it's not in the actual movie i don't think and it's <laughs> Rosie running out to the outfield and she slips <laughs> and did Tom bring it or did Rosie go this one's my favorite no Tom brought it Tom brought it he's like here's my favorite clip and she's yeah. eating it <laughs> yeah. I also my favorite line of the movie is when Madonna is trying to convince Gina Davis, here's the thing, like, we hit a home run, I flash my bosom, my, 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 bosom, my, falls my bosom falls out, and Rosie O'Donnell just looks at her and goes, do you think there's a man in this country who hasn't seen your bosoms? <laughs> May. And she's, like, so concerned. May, do you think there's a man in this country who hasn't seen your bosoms? <laughs> And like, there's she, so many lines that are funny. she's not even being ironic about it she's like okay <laughs> daddy i'm just saying i'm running okay i'm running and it just comes out it and it pops just open. it just pops open because they're that desperate to do anything they can to help to the, save league, the league to save the league and then it's like titties kisses <laughs> for foul balls with ellen may who somehow got hotter in this rewatch of the movie. I was like, is Ellen May prettier than I remember her <laughs> to be? Um, so funny. And then, like, they tried to touch that. Oh. Ag- again, ahead. they were really heavy-handed in the 
let's make a point about women and then they didn't make a point at all because they took out all of the context of the movie yeah so the com- when you and i were talking about the jimmy dugan checking in with gina davis when she's yeah. leaving i found the i found the transcript it's like i know he gave her a speech he gave her a speech he says taking a day trip dotty no bob and i are driving home to oregon jimmy long pause you know i really thought you were a ball player dotty well you were wrong was i dotty yeah it was it's only a game jimmy it's only a game and i and i don't need this i have bob i don't need this at all jimmy i gave away five years at the end of my career drinking five years and now there isn't anything i wouldn't give to get back any day of it dotty well we're different jimmy this is chicken shit, Dotty. If you want to go back to Oregon and make a hundred babies, great. I'm in no position to tell anyone how to live. But sneaking out like this, quitting, you'll regret it for the rest of your life. Baseball is what gets inside you. It's what lights you up. You can't deny that. Dotty, it just got too hard. Jimmy, it's supposed to be hard. If it wasn't hard, everyone would do it. The hard is what makes it great. There's no crying in baseball. <laughs> Ugh, this movie's a great movie. I wish the show would have been great. You know, I wish it, it, it's one of those things in life. This is, sounds so terrible, and I'm just an asshole. But it's one of those same moments in life when you're when I regret not just saying like "fuck you" to everybody and taking my baby and moving to LA and trying to have a career, because in my mind I had this show built. Yeah, for the last. 30 years I've been mm-hmm. building this show in my head. What would I do to honor the stories that didn't get to be a part of the all American girls baseball league? Yeah. What would I do to honor the league in general, the impact, the influence? My grandmother was the right age for all of this stuff during mm-hmm. that time. And she's not a sports person, but my, you know, but we grew up, my grandfathers, both of them loved baseball. We grew up watching baseball. And so I appreciate that Abby Jacobson's version had so many people who are queer in the cast and that yeah. is wonderful. It also when you go back and watch the original and then compare the two, the original still stands taller because you have so much heart. You really do feel you really do feel it. You really yeah. do understand it. Like when um, the guy's like, what do you mean you're shutting it down? Like the, the board and uh, Gary Marshall's like, the war's ending. The boys are coming back. Like, we're sorry. And he's like, oh, I guess this is how it's going to be in the factories too. Like, okay, Rosie, turn in your rivets. We tell these women to get out of the kitchen. It's their American duty to do this and help their country. And now we're just going to send them back to the kitchen. And Gary Marshall, you want us to send the boys coming back from war to the kitchen? Like that is snapshot of what america was like when it came to the conversation about women is was so impactful to me as a child Mm -hmm. not even as a child because the movie came out when i was eight so yeah a child that it highlighted to me that it wasn't just it wasn't as glamorous as these memory shows were doing like to me a league of their own was literally saying It's cute that you guys want to, like, God complex what was going on with women standing tall. Here's a a harsh dose with a lot of heart of how it felt to be in that era. And it helped me understand my grandmothers better. Always have your own money. Don't rely on your husband necessarily. It's okay to try and do something that you want to do with your life. Don't worry about getting married. Make sure you're educated. Like, all the messages they gave me, I think I understood where it came from because of this movie. Well, and I think a bigger slap in the face is they wanted us to be grateful that mm-hmm. they had to rely on us during the war. Right. So it's like, not only are you relying on us during the war because you've shipped everyone else that you usually rely on out. Mm-hmm. But then you want us to be like, well, thank you, sir, for letting me play baseball. Thank you. I really love my new riveting gun. Like, no. And they wanted that's to, captured they wanted to, in May's speech. Yeah. You're not shutting me down. 
That's right. And and at the end at the end of the day, like I think a league of their own highlighted that you know, and I do think we should go. I want to go see them at the baseball hall of fame if that exhibit is actually a thing. <laughs> Yeah, it was. I don't know if it's still standing, but it was for sure. I think that actually, it. Oh, I think the time it opened was earlier. I think the exhibit opened in like the late eighties. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's still part of the. But it's one. Of I those... do want to go to Cooperstown. That is that is a real thing on my bucket list is to go to Cooperstown. I think what it is is like a league of their own took these monoliths where it's like these are our heroes these are the mm -hmm. women and rosie riveters and all of it and it made them your mom yeah. or it's your aunt playing baseball and now i'm going to be an asshole and i'm going to sound just like my mom when i said when i say that the amazon prime uh show was just trying to shove points down my throat mm -hmm. that like these people matter yeah, I knew that they mattered. I wanted them to matter to me. You know, and it's interesting because I feel like that's a lot of television and movies these days. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of like, here's a very pointed, not so subtle message, heavy handed, nail it on the head. Whereas, you know, with A League of Their Own, there's a lot of messaging, but there's also a lot of nuance. Yeah. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of stuff that we grew up with watching in the 90s and some of the 80s, not really, but the 90s, where it was like, here's heavy messaging, but you don't feel like you're being preached at right. because it's nuanced. And we're getting a lot of preachy shit right now. And that's really hard because, like, I was just, I just, I was just. Again, I have this conversation with my friend Nikki all the time. You can stop telling me that my people were enslaved. Give me Correct. other shit. <laughs> right. Because it's becoming more and more aggressive over time. Like the message of we were enslaved right. feels like it's becoming more and more aggressive over time. And that's like, hard for me. Like right. so we're currently um, reminding white people that we killed Emmett Till. And it's you like, know, I, I know that we killed Emmett Till over a lie. I also didn't need that lady to say it on her deathbed. And and there's a way, I don't know, like the 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 Malcolm X movie was so good. Yeah. And it wasn't preachy. At least to me, it didn't feel preachy. I also didn't grow up during Malcolm X, right? Like I'm coming mm -hmm. in after Malcolm X's death. I read his autobiography, but watching the movie, it didn't feel like a heavy-handed message of this is what Malcolm X was about. It felt like this is what Malcolm X was about. This is his life. Here well, you go. It's... It felt like a biopic. It felt informational. It didn't feel like you motherfuckers don't right. understand Malcolm X. Yeah. And I think what ends up happening too is the people who get it, get it. But then you're just literally pissing off the people who don't get it. And yeah. now they're loud. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I don't need them to be loud about anything else. Please make them feel something for the people that they're watching on screen. Mm -hmm. So they empathize with yeah. the people who surround them. Right. That's a huge part of it. And I feel like a lot of that is missing nowadays. Um, yeah. And I think that's probably why I'm always gravitating towards Marvel movies. Because it... It's a superhero storyline. I'm sure if you wanted to get deep about it, you can get deep about it. But at the end of the day, like, you can be superficial about it. Yeah. And there's an art to subtleness mm -hmm. that when it is absent, you notice. Where yeah. it's like, my God, you're just hitting me over the head with it and it makes your characters one dimensional yeah what did we know about carson she liked making out with greta the end mm -hmm. what did we know about greta she felt shame because she liked making out with women the end yeah and compared to sorry go ahead finish your thought compared to the way that doris's dad accident not accidentally, unintentionally, slut shames May. Mm -hmm. That happens. 
your dad is always accidentally slut shaming someone and you have to be like don't hey you could have kept that one to yourself Mm -hmm. and even further than that too with dotty and kit there you understand kit feels overshadowed by dotty with dotty you understand she's conflicted she loves playing she loves her sister she loves her husband but a woman's place in her mind she's not and i felt like this movie was her trying to deal with her desire to want more Mm -hmm. her desire of wanting more but her obligation of what a good woman does in 1941 and i think what happens in the prime show is that abby jacobson made it almost too easy for the women to have their way as if it was 2022 Mm. oh nick offerman quit we don't need to rehire him um oh carson's husband comes back good news he's gonna say that he doesn't need a baby right away and she can keep playing and it's like that feels unrealistic to me yeah because there's a level of so so like historical fiction Mm -hmm. right is a whole genre and there is a level where you how are you true to what was happening at the time correct and then playing a new game so like bridgerton i think with their colorblind casting does a really good job because it's based on fake shit yeah right the aristocracy is real but the bridgertons are fucking fake right <laughs> so it doesn't matter if print if queen charlotte is black or not because it's a fucking fake thing the all-american girls baseball league is real so to tie in things that are true to the time so staying true to the time, but still being able to make it not feel like you're reinforcing negative stereotypes. Correct. I feel like the 92 version does that. Yeah. Yes. And that's, I think, a lot of, like, okay, can I just, not to be a tangent, but everyone's losing their shit about Blonde right now. Yeah. And part, And I'm like, first of all, it's not a biopic. No. Anybody who read the book will tell you it's in the fiction section of the bookstore. Correct. This is not a true to Marilyn Monroe's life story. She didn't sign off on this. She didn't. Her estate, not super thrilled. They're like, okay, it's good. Meh. Um, but that's but that's another example of like right. this is fiction. There's creative license here. However, because it's a real person, there is a weird line where you have to balance delicately because there are some things that just are factually inaccurate that happen in this movie. Like she doesn't die before Cass chat or she doesn't die after Cass Chaplin. He dies six years after she dies. Mm -hmm. And like, there's little things like that where I'm just like, okay, it's fake. It's fake. It's fake. But then somebody um, on Instagram sent me a DM because I was like bitching about like people being so upset about this biopic. I'm like, it's not a biopic. Stop calling it a biopic. Right. And they were like, it's being marketed like a biopic. It It is. And I was like, shit, I guess because I read the book 20 years ago, I walked into knowing it's not a biopic. It, it is literally being marketed like they are telling Marilyn's story as if yeah. Marilyn gets to. No, this is Joyce Carol Oates' imagination of Marilyn Monroe's life. That's what this is. And then my urging to Joyce Carol Oates is, why didn't you just do what anyone does? Tell Marilyn Monroe's story without naming her Marilyn. Marilyn Monroe wasn't the only woman abused by the system around her, Hollywood Mm. or not. No. So, like, there's a story there. You can imagine exactly what happened with Marilyn Monroe, and we all do. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to tell what you assumed happened to her, name her anything but Marilyn. Yeah. So, like... It's just like, it's a miss on everyone for me. Like, Joyce Carol Oates, that's irresponsible. And that book came out in 1999. Right. No one wants a fictional account of Marilyn Monroe's life because the nonfiction account is horrific enough. Number two, then it's the marketing of it all to me. Like, that's irresponsible. 
one way that I think that we've seen this done right, I haven't watched the movie yet, but maybe I will now that my weekend has freed up. In The Hate You Give, I kept telling you as I was reading it, I go, they don't pull any punches, but they also don't tell me that they're not pulling punches on purpose. Right. It is literally a little girl living in her neighborhood Mm -hmm. through the horrific death and murder of her friend. Yeah. And they're not pulling any punches about what this neighborhood is like. But there's like no footnote to be like, and three out of seven neighborhoods in America are like this or whatever. Yeah. It's literally, this is the truth. Yeah. And I think that a league of their own does that because you can't change the fact that they probably did have to make out with guys during foul balls. 1992 like, version. <clears throat> yeah. The 1992 version. You can't like, you probably can't change the fact that there was a lot of, you know, queer uh bias duh duh <laughs> yeah there were hella laws again and in some states some of those laws are still on the fucking books duh like it's a duh for me like amazon prime you didn't have to like make that everyone's story in the show for me to be like oh because those issues are still happening today yeah so why didn't you just tell me a story mm-hmm. without making it a did you know show so- yes i knew Yeah. And I think what's beautiful about certain types of storytelling that doesn't necessarily happen anymore is that it, like you're saying, the Mm -hmm. did you know doesn't exist. It's just, we're plopping you in. Yeah. Here's a snippet. God, I miss, I miss that about the way we told stories. Huh? I know. I miss good storytelling. I miss when you could trust your audience to go there with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's also happening, and we've seen it happening for years, it's just not just new with the League of Their Own Prime show, is no one wants a show that's going to be complicated, mm-hmm. so we just spoon feed them everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you can spoon feed everything and still have a, sh- a movie that's good, Top Gun Maverick. I didn't see it. You don't have to. I actually think it might make you angry. Um, Because I don't like Tom Cruise. Because Tom Cruise's character hasn't grown in 35 years. He's still a, you know, huffy, puffy, I'm right guy. But it's still an enjoyable movie because they're they're so committed to the plot. There's nothing complicated about it. The acting's pretty decent. And they give us a beach scene where everyone's half naked with all the mabs. I'm not mad at it. Bodies, bodies, bodies was a very simple story, and yet I was tense the entire time. Yeah, see, there's another example, right? Like that was a good movie. And then we see Don't Worry, Darling. I know. (laughs) And then we see Don't Worry, Darling, and we see these places where people refuse to fill in the holes for themselves. Yeah. So they're mad at Olivia Wilde for not telling them. To which I would argue, and I haven't made this argument yet to the people who just scream at me that there were so many holes in that movie. Mm -hmm. That movie, you're living as Alice. So what Alice knows, you know. And there were things that she had time to try and figure out and discover. And then there were things that she didn't have time to figure out and discover. Like people were like, why didn't we go in deeper as to why Olivia Wilde would choose this? Because we didn't have the time. We were going to be murdered. Right. Why don't we know where the men got this information? Because Alice doesn't know. We lived that movie through Alice. Right. We forget that our narrator is where we get our information. Yeah. And we're so used to the viewpoint of we know everything. Yeah. Like the narrator knows everything. Yes. And I just, I don't particularly care for that style even when i was studying it in school and even in high school all through it like i was just like i don't want i don't give me give me the narrator who's unstable (laughs) are you the one no who just told me that they don't like unreliable narrators oh no i I, i'm here for an unreliable narrator it must have been one of my friends that i was out to dinner with and then they were like holden called it the kid in the catcher and the rye who i can't fucking stand yeah he's the worst (laughs) 
They were like, he's fine because he's a teenager. I go, well, he's a teenager that'll grow into an abusive old man. Like, he's not fine because he's a teenager. Look, it is six o'clock. We don't have that kind of time for you to tell me who that was so I could yell at them in the DMs about that. Okay. <laughs> I don't even remember who it was. Um, this has been our discovery of a league of their own. Let's do our last question. Jules, were you still comfy with the movie? I was. I was because all the things that I was like icky, it was like, well, it's 1941. So that's right. why it's icky. And I think sometimes we lose sight of if there's no ickiness, then we don't know what's icky and what isn't icky anymore. Like sometimes yeah. there has to be ickiness put into a plot point or a story so we can go, oh my God, that's icky. Yeah, and then we and, start to read our reactions. <laughs> yeah, and when I say icky, I mean things like when Doris's dad slut shames May. Yeah, when, but dad still be slut shaming. Yeah, exactly. And, or when like they're all constantly referring to the women as girls, you know, like that kind of stuff. We're just like, yeah. okay, that's icky, but it's not like so icky that you're just like, I can't hang, right? Um, because again, it's you know a. I don't want to say accurate to the time pe- time period, but it you know it makes it more authentic at least. I think. Yeah, I think we get hung up on a lot of things of like we fix that. It mm-hmm. shouldn't be in a movie anymore. And I'm like, we haven't fixed sexual assault. Re-release Thelma and Louise right now. Every woman's gonna have something to say about how it's true. And men still refer to women as girls. As girls, even they're grown ass, even though they're grown ass women. And daddy still slut shame your friends. Yeah. Like, and people still would have judged Marla on her looks. If part of your job was being good looking, Marla wouldn't have gotten hired. Right. So Marla Hooch. Marla Hooch. She's kind of my favorite. (laughs) She's the best. Her and Madonna. Oh Oh my gosh. And Rosie's just so fun in this. Rosie's so fucking fun. Why didn't Rosie and Madonna just become a power duo who was in every movie together? You know, I don't think that Madonna wanted to because do you remember when she'd come on Rosie's show? They had they were friends in real life. Yeah. So I don't know. Maybe Madonna didn't want to act. Maybe you don't have to do it all. Harry Styles. And maybe you shouldn't. I am also still comfy with the movie. The movie still makes me warm and gooey. It still makes me go, ugh, men in all of the right places. Yeah. (laughs) Tom Hanks is disgusting and I love it. Yeah. I love a disgusting, sloppy Tom Hanks. Yep. And Gina Davis is gorgeous. And they're all hot. And Bill Pullman is so fucking fine in that movie just like i even feel like they fucked with the lighting around him so they'd be like see how gorgeous he is i mean if you can pull off the bill pullman high cutie to oh, me God. i might cave i might start marrying men again <laughs> it's sweater season i've already told men who have been putting on their cardigans i'm like nothing makes me reconsider dating men again <laughs> like a fucking cable net sweater i go however neither one of us is going to be happy because no man can penetrate me until i get my bodily autonomy back yep. do you hear me congress no one gets to ejaculate anywhere near me <laughs> until i get my bodily autonomy back um also california we have a bill coming up on the ballot a proposition rather that makes keeps it protected in our state so Mm -hmm. You know what to do, California. Don't fuck it up. Don't fuck it up. Don't fuck it up. Because I will make all of California sex starve you. It's my new platform. There's a lot of people here. There's 40 million people in this state. We sex starve the people who took away our bodily autonomy. We sex starve them until they give it back. (laughs) Jules, Mm. tell the people where they can find you. Friends, I'm on Instagram. I have a couple the julia washington for book reviews and me just being sometimes a hot mess or really put together and beautiful it just depends on the day if you love the concept of my show pop culture makes me jealous where we analyze pop culture through the lens of race or gender and sometimes both you can find us on the gram pop culture makes me jealous if you have a story of everyday misogyny and you don't want to say it on instagram or on a hot mic 
uh, you can DM it to me and I will find someone else who has an adjacent story to yours. And we will do an entire episode about the misogyny that you yourself have experienced. Because that's the whole point of to all the men I've tolerated before, that our stories of everyday misogyny get told because we like to pretend that misogyny just is fixed. Like women get to work and vote now. What more do we want? Not wrong um, if you're in Georgia, oh God, or Mississippi, they're coming for you. They're coming for all of us. The war of women is secretly gaining ground. Never forget it. It's my last thought that I think as I fall asleep. And it's the first thought that I think of when I wake up. We are living in a war against women and femme presenting humans and anyone who isn't a white cis straight man we are on instagram at men i've tolerated pod i am on instagram and uh tiktok at nably k124 there is no shortage of me on the internet last night i told a friend not to cry that i couldn't go to trivia on wednesday because i'm seeing bros and he may miss me. And he said, don't worry. I could always listen to your podcast. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and everyone, tomorrow night, we'll be on Instagram Live talking about the one and only One Tree Hill and season two and all of these fuck boys that they've incorporated into my show. And <laughs> we're going to be on the river court. So tomorrow night, we'll see you on the river court and stay cozy, stay comfy. I almost want to add San Francisco like I'm fucking Will like Ferrell. Like we're on the news or something. Yeah. Stay cozy. Stay comfy. Enjoy the weather. Enjoy the weather. Stay comfy. Stay cozy, San Francisco. I really love this episode of Still Comfy with Natalie because A League of Their Own is one of, again, I've said it already, one of my all-time top five favorite movies ever and now that it's summer it's time to dust it off the shelf and watch it every saturday while crying and learning new depths of my soul pop culture makes me jealous is written edited and produced by me your host and we are supported through our patreon community if you want more of this show you can join patreon to get one bonus episode a month access to our quarterly socially hour <laughs> socially hour <laughs> How about access to our quarterly social hour and access to our live book club? We've recently revamped the Patreon to accommodate our new show releasing soon, Jelly Pops Book Club Podcast, where we will dive into book-to-screen adaptations. You can find us on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Julia Washington. You can also find the show on Instagram or TikTok at Pop Culture Makes Me Jealous. If you want to talk about A League of Their Own, I'm here for it. If you want to share this episode with somebody who also loves A League of Their Own, do that too. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. Until next time. <laughs>